Hello, good morning, everybody. My name is Karolina Vigura, and I am a member of the board of Cultura Liberona Foundation. And I have the pleasure to open uh, the third discussion in the series, um, which is organized under the program of the Warsaw European Forum. This year, um, all um, our events are devoted to the war in Ukraine and the Russian aggression on Ukraine. Uh, today, we will have the great uh, pleasure to speak about uh, energy and economics and uh, to what extent Europe might be an independent player in this whole const new constellation that has been created by the war in, in Ukraine. Um, our um, series uh, is organized due to the uh, generous support of a few organizations and I would like to, to name them now and to thank you um, uh, to thank very much to those organizations. Without them, it would be not possible to, to meet on a regular basis and think about the long-term consequences of the war in Ukraine uh, for the European and global order. Uh, those uh, organizations are the Polish-German Foundation uh, for Cooperation, uh, the Zeit uh, Foundation, as well as uh, the Fried Ort Foundation. Thank you so much for supporting us. And now I will give the floor uh, to Ursula Weidenfeld, who will be the chair of the today's meeting. Ursula, please take the floor and introduce our today's speaker. Thank you, Karolina. Welcome. My name is Ursula Weidenfeld. I, I'm working as a free gen, freelance economic journalist in Berlin. And I have the pleasure to welcome the participants as well as um, everybody else in the discussion on Europe, on the question Europe without Russian energy, is it possible? When and what will it mean to Europe? Um, welcome to Ralf Fuchs. He is managing director and co-founder of the Center of Liberal Modernity. Before that, he has been uh, president of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, which is the um, um, think tank mainly for the Green Party in Germany. Uh, before that, he has been uh, co-chair of the German Green Party and Senator of Environment and City Development in Bremen, where we say hello to you today. You are uh, connected from Bremen, so fine, great to have you with us. Kasper Slujeki is research professor at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. He's a fellow at the Include Research Center for Socially Inclusive Energy Transitions at the University of Oslo and also columnist and editor at Cultural Liberalnia. Jaroslava Marysik, she's, um, hello, <laughs> she's, um, a uh, PhD candidate and lecturer at the Department of International Relations and International Organization at the University of Groningen, which is in the Netherlands. And Elina Brustin is with us. She's a research scholar at the International Institute for Applied System Analysis, Energy, Climate and Environment Program, and uh, this is based in Austria. So we will start with short kickoff kickoff statements and to all of you who have joined us uh, shortly before we will record the kickoff statements but not the discussion afterwards the discussion after afterwards will be confidential under chatham house rules so uh, we will be open to discuss every everything very open and free and Ralf, if I may, I would ask you to start oh. because um, you are the one I, I, I know best and I know your book on energy transition and on the future of industrial society. So it would be very interesting to hear your points in, a, in the new light of the uh, war in the Ukraine. Thanks a lot, Ursula, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I think we, we all are aware that we are in a very special moment now to discuss um, European energy future for the backdrop of Russia's war of aggression against uh, Ukraine. Um, this war will not only uh, change the security landscape or uh, the European security order um, 
depending from its uh, outcome. So or so, yeah, if, if uh, Russia will uh, be successful with this uh, war, um, the European security order will be in shambles. It uh, will be a permanent uh, crisis and um, a threat of future wars. Uh, if Ukraine uh, will resist with a little help from our Western allies, um, maybe it will be possible to, to uh, contain and deter uh, Russia from future military adventures. Um, but anyway, it will deeply change the relationship between uh, Russia and um, Europe, or I should say the big rest of Europe, because for me, Russia still um, um, is partly a European country. Um, and, and this will have um, uh, deep consequences also for the future of economic and energy relations between the European Union and, and, and Russia. As you know, um, probably, we are in the midst of a really uh, fierce discussion in Germany about uh, energy, uh, about an energy embargo against Russia. Of course, it could not be done uh, only uh, nationally. It must be done in uh, concerted action within the European Union. Uh, and I would be, be interested uh, uh, to get a better understanding how this discussion um, goes on in, in Poland and other European uh, countries. We all know that um, the uh, European Union, um, I would not say is in the same extent depending from uh, Russian fossil fuels like uh, Germany intentionally um, did over, over the last 20 years. Uh, our governments um, um, consciously <laughs> uh, um, followed a policy of um, strategic energy partnership with Russia. But uh, more or less, uh, this also um, is the case for, for other European countries. If you're looking to energy imports of the EU, um, Russian oil covers around about a third of uh, oil consumption in, in the EU. Uh, gas, it's uh, around about 25%. In Germany, it's 55%. And uh, coal also around about 25%, in Germany 40%. Uh, so getting rid of the um, of, of, uh, Russian the fossil ed, uh, fuels um, let's say, uh, asks for um, at least three um, very challenging um, than efforts uh, of, of, of for, for Europe. The first one, and uh, short. This is short and medium term. Of course, the diversification of um, energy imports, especially in uh, the gas and and oil sector, um, with uh, increased. Uh, capacities for liquid natural gas, uh, especially from uh, the US, but also from, from other countries. I would say uh, the US is uh, probably the only uh, really reliable and democratic source of uh, LNG. If you look to, to the other potential uh, the gas exporters, uh, they are all more or less critical in political terms. Then the second um, uh, big effort has uh, to be on uh, increasing energy efficiency and energy savings. 
also on the short and, and medium term, creating more um, economic uh, welfare with less energy resources. Um, and again, in all three um, main sectors of energy consumption, the, the, the building sector, so heating and cooling, uh, they may be the main resource for energy savings over the next uh, years. Uh, the industry, uh, which made significant progress over the last uh, 10, 15 years in, in energy efficiency, but still, of course, there is potential. Um, and finally, the mobility sector um, with the electrification uh, of uh, transport. Yeah, this is the main resource, of course, to um, replace uh, oil, not only from Russia, by renewable energies. And this is the third big um, conclusion we have to, to draw from this uh, current uh, crisis. We have to speed up uh, the, the uh, development, the production of renewable energies of all kinds. It's not only about uh, solar and uh, wind and sustainable biofuels. Um, it's also now speeding up uh, the uh, development of a hydrogen dung economy. Um, and we have to do this, this is my final point, not just in a national effort, we, we, we must do it in a um, trans-European um, effort to build up a trans-European network of uh, renewable energies from Scandinavia to the Mediterranean and beyond, including the Maghreb countries and, and uh, the Middle East as a partner for renewable energies and from the Atlantic to Ukraine. Yeah? And, and this kind of an, a widespread uh, trans-European network of renewable energies will also um, work as a kind of a buffer uh, for the fluctuating uh, renewable energy sources, especially wind and, and, and solar. So um, I think if we, last sentence, uh, if, we, if we take this uh, crisis as a chance, um, it could uh, then work as a kind of catalytic factor, accelerator for the anyway necessary energy transition before the backdrop of uh, climate change and uh, making our, our economy sustainable. But it will take a lot of uh, political uh, determination and uh, a, a lot of concerted action on, on the European level. And it will take a lot of time, will it? Yeah, I think there are different um, time spans. We have, we have short-term uh, uh, opportunities and challenges, medium and long-term, and we have to, to link these uh, long different uh, long time spans in a, in a, in a smart way. Um, anyway, we have <laughs> to, to, to kick off um, uh, this transition now. Thank you very much. Kaspar, you, um, you, you thought and you talked already about um, the, the links between the long-term um, uh, the, the long questions and, and the short-term um, must-dos. And if you could follow Ralph, I would be grateful. Yes, thanks, Art. I mean, Ralph uh, covered a lot of ground already. Um, a lot of good points there. Uh, I will try to fill some, some gaps, perhaps. Uh, I think that, um, well, Europe's dependence on Russian energy is very deep. It's very long-standing. It's uh, sticky in a way. Um, so it's something that is going to be difficult to get rid of. But at the same time, I think we should not demonize um, the idea of, of a full-scale embargo. I mean, the world is not going to no. end. The world is not going to end. No, I'm not saying that you did it, but it's just more that I know that in the German debate, in the general European debate, there is a lot of... Uh, scaremongering uh, against this. 
and it is going to hurt but perhaps this is a this is a kind of pain that is um, I mean a catharsis as well um, there's also a lot of blame games being played right now kind of in hindsight a lot of people are looking for conspiratorial explanations of how we got here um, a lot of soul searching as well among experts and policymakers but in the end I think that Europe's dependence on Russian energy resources is, well, primarily due to geography. I mean, we have this energy resource rich uh, neighboring country, and it was always uh, the simplest idea to just import things from Russia. Um, and let's not forget that our dependence on Russia is in all sectors. You already highlighted this, Ralph. Uh, I mean, Russia is the largest supplier of uh, of oil um, for Europe and is the second largest supplier of oil in the world, the, the largest exporter of natural gas, the third largest exporter of coal in the world. And there's also another sector that we tend to forget about, that's, that's nuclear energy. Uh, this is a sector which is worth for Russia uh, $138 billion if you add up all the projects that Rosatom, the, the national uh, the nuclear energy champion is boasting in 49 countries across the world. So it's it's a no, not not a small uh, sector either. Uh, we have seen controversies, for instance, with Slovakia continuing to import uranium from from Russia and even uh, detouring the the ban for flights of, of Russian aircraft over uh, EU airspace. Uh, so th that's another thing to to keep in mind and also to discuss. But on the whole, I would really like to, uh, you know, perhaps just to sketch a bit the background, like how did we get here? How is it that we really found ourselves in this in this situation? Because I think it's a series of, of choices that have been made over the years, which were not necessarily malign, but in the end, they were also um, perhaps underwritten by, by a certain idealism and, and naive assumptions, a belief in best case scenarios and ignoring warning signs and reality checks that uh, showed uh, themselves along the way, I mean, at least since 2006. Um, energy policy is very often cast in the form of a, of a triangle, of a trilemma, uh, where apparently you have to choose between economic considerations, that's affordability, uh, sustainability, so minimizing environmental impacts, and then there's security of supply, so energy availability. And Europe had a very long-term preoccupation with affordability, so there was this economic rationale that was primary, uh, and then recently that was also coupled with the climate focus on sustainability, When and then security issues were sidelined. It's not that they were completely ignored, but I think that a lot of people both in Brussels and in, in, in national capitals, we're thinking that those things will somehow fix themselves. And now we're left in a situation where, where we finally really have to confront a very harsh reality and not the best case scenario, but kind of a worst case scenario being realized. And a lot of people are just at a loss uh, about what to do. And this is also due to the fact that there were two dominant conceptions of energy security competing in Europe. Uh, one uh, was based on abundance and high interdependence, and this is kind of the classic German approach, uh, where you believe that if you increase uh, the intensity of interdependence and then cooperation, you're going to kind of bring about more energy security. In a sense, it works perhaps for, for the partners themselves, so for Germany it might work, but it uh, pushes the risk of uh, well, energy security risk onto others. And here Ukraine, of course, has been the, uh, the, the, the most important loser of the whole situation. Um, and then the other conception is, is focusing on self-sufficiency in autarky. And that's probably the, the Polish approach most uh, importantly, because Poland has for many years been relying on indigenous energy resources, especially on coal. Uh, and so this idea of autarky was conceivable because in Germany it was never conceivable because Germany has always always had to import uh, energy resources and had to import them from different places. So for Germany, autarky can or, or some degree of, of self sufficiency can only be achieved through renewables actually, and that also explains the German strategy right now. So the Easter uh, policy package that has been uh, introduced just just now. 
Um, so if Europe is to get rid of its inter uh, of its dependence on Russian gas, um, I mean, Raoul has already mentioned a tripartite strategy. I would probably say something similar, but, but perhaps emphasizing elements differently. So the first thing is that we have to look for alternative sources of fossil fuels. And yes, LNG from, from the US is going to be important. Uh, also Norway, of course, has a large uh, role to play, uh, both in, in, in gas, in oil, but also in electricity. Um, however, we will probably not be able to, you know, put a human rights clause to all energy imports that we that we have. So, I mean, this is the problem with, with energy in general, that fossil fuels tend to be located in countries that don't have the best human rights records and are not necessarily democratic. And there's, of course, a causal relationship there and between fossil fuels and, and democracy levels. Um, the second element is that we have to look for ways to replace fossil fuels. So looking for alternative uh, energy sources. And this is going to be, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to just sum up in, in two minutes because it very much depends on sectors and fuels. Different things are replaced with different uh, alternative resources. And then I will emphasize this really strongly. We have to reduce our energy use. And this is going to be the most important short-term solution. So if we're going to be faced with an oil embargo, either uh, initiated by Europe or a result of a Russian political decision, which is which can happen. I mean, we've seen this discussion around the payments in rubles uh, that Russians are kind of e perhaps even possibly going to self-impose an embargo on, on Russian energy resources. Then we have to find ways to cope. And the good news is that we are going to survive this. I mean, it's not that this is going to really make uh, Europe collapse, especially now, I mean, looking out of the window here, at least in Norway, it's getting warm. It's uh, so gas as a, as a source of uh, heating is losing importance uh, for half of the year. Uh, and so now the focus is primarily on, on the industry and other uses, and it's going to be much easier to actually substitute this. Or so reduce. you would recommend to just use the, the, the summer to um, prepare for a, a hard winter, which we can yes. sustain them? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, now is the time to rebuild uh, energy storage, uh, to, to, to fill up all the storages that we have and to really prepare and also to make contingency plans. I mean, I just a bit of self-promotion here, but we just uh, issued a, a policy brief together with Carsten Neuhoff of Tief Berlin uh, and Andreas Goldtau from, from Erfurt and uh, Isabella Weber from uh, Massachusetts University on the things that Europe has to do to plan ahead for such uh, an abrupt energy uh, shortage, especially gas shortage. Uh, and, you know, we have to really start planning now. We need targets for, for gas saving uh, because governance by targets is effective. We've seen that in, in other policy areas. And this is something that has to be done collectively and in a participatory manner so that we do not really leave any vulnerable groups behind. And we also need to engage uh, households in this because households are generally protected from from gas prices because there's tariffs that are managed nationally and they don't really respond to price signals. So so there's there's a lot of uh, work uh, to do in, in, in this area. Just two just two final points. Um, one is that um, phasing out energy imports from Russia is going to be this new rationale for EU energy policy. We've seen that already from the Commission's uh, Repower Europe initiative. But luckily, this is also in line with Europe's longer term climate goals, and it has to be kept in line with this. What we are going to see is going to be an acceleration of phase out of fossil fuels, uh, I hope, initiated by, by this crisis. And then finally, there's been a lot of talk about Europe's strategic autonomy. I think that in, in security uh, and defense, uh, the, the war in Ukraine shows that Europe is not really prepared for this. I mean, the US, if we didn't have the US with, with Joe Biden right now, I'm not sure where we would be. And of course, this is a, a bit of a uh, critical point towards uh, Olaf Scholz and, and, and uh, the SPD in, in power in Germany. However, if we expand this idea of strategic autonomy to like a green strategic autonomy and whether Europe is able to be self-sufficient 
in terms of energy and its climate ambitions, then I think, uh, reiterating again what, what Ralph said, we can turn this uh, crisis into a, a booster of uh, ambitious climate uh, policy and energy transition. I really believe in that. Well, thank you very much. And um, that is probably the point, uh, Jaroslava, where you can just um, come in and not only in, in, in your kickoff statement, but also in the discussion, you just um, deal a lot with um, the question of um, transition of um, um, energy transition and on um, sustainable energy. So if you just could um, follow Casper, it would be nice. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, my my uh, uh, my speaking notes will so uh, echo a little bit of uh, what has been already said, obviously. And um, uh, yeah, so um, what I think is that uh, today's event is a very good opportunity to re-evaluate EU-Russia energy debates that were dominant in the past decades. Uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine two months ago uh, demonstrated that attempts to depoliticize energy policy in the EU, especially by framing gas trade with Russia as an exclusive domain of market-based uh, transactions, have failed. That's one of what Kasper has made at this point as well in his uh, speech. And uh, some uh, some uh, experts have argued for, for years that Russia proved itself a reliable partner and a reliable oil and gas supplier, and that such dependency on Russian oil and gas can not only be benefit the EU's economy, but also can improve living standards in Russia. This interdependency in energy trade can improve the overall geopolitical climate, but uh, obviously what we see today is a different uh, picture and that uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine uh, probably came to many as a surprise. Uh, so with the announcement of Russia's special military operation, President Putin, um, I, I just found this quote, followed the, in the footsteps of the Catherine the Great imperialist thinking, who apparently can be quoted saying, uh, I have no way to defend my, my borders, uh, but to extend them. It can also be paraphrased uh, that Putin has no other way to defend his dictatorship, uh, but to occupy or destroy the neighboring country that dared to aspire for democracy and independent foreign and security policy. And... Um, what 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 else, what else can be added that the narrative of Russian propaganda that Ukraine being a member a member of NATO uh, that it would attack Russia uh, which has the third army in the world the third strongest army in the world has nuclear weapons and the country size ten times bigger than Ukraine and that Ukraine will try forcefully take Crimea back. That was uh, all developed for domestic consumption of Russian state TV audiences, but also there is another narrative about NATO promises in the 90s and not to expand, as you're all aware of, uh, not, not crossing these red lines, right, just before the start of the war. Uh, uh, this red lines, red not crossing the red lines, this narrative was repeated many times. Um, that, that narrative was constructed for Western audiences and supported by American realists like John Mersheimer, for example. Um, he promotes the idea that the West is responsible for not respecting Russia and provoking it to attack. Uh, that's completely, what is very important for Ukrainians, that's completely denying the agency to Ukraine, right? And the right to defend itself against aggressive neighbor. Uh, last month, he wrote an article in The Economist and claimed that the trouble over Ukraine started at NATO's Bucharest summit in 2008. And, uh, and that he, he, in this article, he was still insisting that there was the civil, that was the civil war that broke in the Donbass in 2014. So this narrative about the civil war still strongly convergent with the Russian interpretation. And uh, not looking beyond 2008, uh, he also neglects more than 350 years of uh, 350 years old history of Ukraine's struggle against Russian dominance. That is maybe not taken into account uh, uh, by by some Western experts. Uh, so the aggressive war waged against people of Ukraine and killing and torturing civilians by tens of thousands by now. Um, having no agreed rules of conducting the war or norms of uh, of norms that would kind of prevent terrorizing civilian populations, even no religious principles to adhere to the ceasefire, even during the Orthodox Easter celebrated by Russians and Ukrainians yesterday. So this brings me to another uh, point, uh, another norm that uh, that has been promoted by international gas industry, uh, namely uh, about gas being as a transitional fuel to renewables. Uh, 
so with the start of the Russian-Ukrainian full-scale war, it becomes increasingly difficult to promote gas in the EU as a bridge fuel. Um, for also blue hydrogen as a climate solution uh, that would help gas companies to stay in business becomes less convincing. Uh, analysis from Reisted Energy in Norway actually uh, demonstrated that high gas prices since October last year pushed, pushed the cost of fossil hydrogen in Europe more than three times higher than the renewable hydrogen. So before the war started, Ukraine had a huge potential uh, in green hydrogen production, especially from the wind energy, in addition to the already existing pipeline infrastructure that could have been refurbished in the future for hydrogen use. And uh, Germany had a goal of attracting 1 billion uh, USD uh, for the Ukrainian renewable energy sector. And Ukraine was the only country mentioned in the German hydrogen strategy. Cooperation with Ukraine was also mentioned in the Euro Europe, hydrogen, uh, Europe hydrogen strategy. However, the, the Russian full-scale attack demonstrated uh, that destroying energy infrastructure in Ukraine uh, by shelling and constant continuous airstrikes is one of the war tactics employed by, Russian, uh, by Russia and its troops. So we talk here about the destruction of wind turbines, solar panels, uh, especially this, uh, they are located in this heavy uh, combat areas in south and east Ukraine, near Mariupol, uh, where the most of the renewables are deployed. Power transmission lines, gas pipelines, hydropower stations have been hit. Uh, there are serious threats to proper function, of, uh, as you know, of nuclear power station. Chernobyl nuclear power uh, station was occupied by Russian troops for more than a month, and uh, International Atomic Energy Agency uh, did not uh, did not uh, was not able to establish any control during the, the time uh, of this occupation, and. Currently, still the Borussia nuclear power uh, plant, the largest in Europe, is still occupied, and Rosatom representatives claim that it belongs to them now. So uh, it, it can be also viewed and uh, can be also described uh, as one of the Ukraine's leading climate scientists mentions, Svetlana Krakowska. The war, this war, is also uh, a fossil fuel war, uh, financed by the EU countries dependent on Russian gas, in addition to burning Russian oil, gas, and coal and that contribute to worsening of the climate efforts. So it is necessary to think uh, and reevaluate how the EU as well as Ukraine, uh, Ukraine as uh, it has been a Russian gas transit country for many years, uh, are complicit in this war fueled uh, by Russian oil and gas uh, for decades actually. So replacing Russian uh, gas supply obviously will not happen overnight. Everyone understands that. But previous energy price shocks, if, if you remember right in, from history in 1973, 1979, spurred climate friendly measures. Uh, for instance, there was a growing interest in developing solar and wind power in Europe uh, and uh, France started developing its nuclear program, uh, which gen generates now 70% of its electricity. So the political, financial, logistics obstacles uh, to winning of Russian gas are serious, yes, and I think we will further discuss today in, uh, during the discussion, but, but not insurmountable. While there is no fast and easy solution, a lot can be done in terms of, as already has been mentioned by the previous two speakers, by accelerating transitioning to green hydrogen economy, using solar and offshore wind energy, energy efficiency, home insulation, and also delaying phasing out the nuclear energy temporarily. Uh, since uh, I'm living in the Netherlands, so in the Netherlands, the debate on using the nuclear energy was reopened in the past few years, and the Dutch society was strongly divided regarding the use of nuclear energy in the past, while its neighboring France and Belgium are still strongly dependent on nuclear energy. And also, um, I'm located in Groningen, University of Groningen, and uh, the Groningen gas field. Uh, if re reopened, could potentially provide about 13 uh, BCMs, which equals to 9% of Russian gas supply. Uh, however, it's more theoretical because uh, since 2014, there has been a strong causality established between the earthquakes in the region, uh, in the province, and the extraction of gas. Yeah, and that was could not uh, overlook could not be overlooked anymore. So the gas drilling needed to be stopped. And uh, so it will be stopped by the end of the year. Uh, that was the Dutch government's decision. And reversing this decision would be highly sensitive politically because of the earthquakes and 100,000 damaged houses of the residents of the Hronjana provinces and so on. 
and, um, and but nevertheless a few days ago facing increasing uh, public pressure in the Netherlands and also rising energy prices the Dutch Minister of Climate and uh, Climate and Energy uh, Rob Yetten he actually announced that uh, the cabinet plans to completely phase out Russian gas and coal by the end of this year by the end of 2022 so uh, the Netherlands consumes about 15% 15 15% of the energy from Russian supplies um, so that amounts approximately to 6 bcms of gas uh, it, it, it is planned that the Russian supplies will be replaced uh, by the increased imports of uh, LNG and other uh, sustainable energy sources. Um, before 2014 war uh, in Donbass, Ukraine uh, also heavily relied on imported Russian gas for its own domestic use. And a few days ago, Ukrainian Minister of Energy announced that the next winter, uh, winter heating season will be completely free of Russian energy supplies. So um, my thinking goes uh, that if it is possible for Ukraine to arrange the alternatives while being in the middle of the ongoing war with Russia to completely stop Russian supplies, if it is possible for the Netherlands to end Russian gas and coal import by the end of this year, then at least a sharp reduction of the gas imports from Russia for the whole EU uh, could be accelerated uh, because the current coal embargo, uh, for, for example, consists only of 3%. Uh, the EU continues to pay uh, 480 million euros daily to Russia for energy supplies, half of which is gas supplies. And there is also obviously a danger that the war uh, becomes protracted, inflicting huge human and economic losses if the heavy we weaponry is not sufficiently provided to Ukraine. And uh, by believing uh, that Russian army is invincible, some key decision makers, especially in, in the German government, deny heavy weapons uh, to be sold to Ukraine, thus significantly diminishing uh, the defensive capabilities of, uh, of Ukraine against Russian attack. If the war is over soon with the victory of Ukraine, it will not significantly jeopardize decarbonization, Paris Agreement commitments. It will even accelerate energy uh, processes despite short-term setbacks. And these short-term setbacks were already mentioned by other speakers like uh, using imported coal, shortly delaying the nuclear energy phase out, relying uh, on expensive LNG in addition to increasing costs of EV batteries and solar panels. However, if the war will be prolonged for years, without the embargo on Russian gas and oil, then the efforts of this fast-track energy transition might be significantly uh, derailed. So in conclusion, I would like to say that the Russian-Ukrainian war has been reshaping debates about energy pricing, renewables, uh, and it, its impact on the climate change mitigation. It will be difficult to depoliticize Russia, Russia EU or Ukraine EU relations, not even mentioning Ukrainian Russian relations uh, or negotiate in the currently negotiating for peace. Therefore, new dimensions and new spheres of repoliticization will emerge. And the concept of energy security in terms of, uh, especially in terms of security of gas and oil supply will be reconceptualized. Overall, EU's energy policy and energy security, EU sanctions against Russia in the energy sector, and to a certain extent also uh, energy transition processes in Europe will remain highly securitized issues as long as the Russian-Ukrainian war continues, but also beyond that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this input and thank you, thank you for uh, your, think, your thoughts, not only on energy, but also on the geopolitical situation uh, now and, and in the foreseeable future. Um, thank you, Kasper, for posting the link. If you all could look in, in the chat, Kasper um, posted a link uh, to the study he mentioned in his, in his input, so we could just read it afterwards, um, if uh, anybody could read it, if, if interested. Elena, Bruchin is the last in our, our input row, and I'm very happy to have you with us because uh, you, are, you are specialized on, um, the, on, on systems and even not, and, and not only on the geopolitical and, and, and energy solution things, but also on the, on the question, how uh, could you in... Um, yeah, how could you implement um, um, uh, energy changes and how could then and, and why and where are they restricted or just uh, pushed forward by political decisions and politicians? I, um, Elena, if you just could um, give us your statement and then could afterwards start to discuss all of this. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. Uh, and as mentioned by previous speakers, I will also reiterate some of the key points and also put a few numbers uh, in context uh, as well when thinking about different strategies. And in my talk, I will also highlight a little bit more the role uh, of the consumers, of the EU consumers. Um, so in 2020, the EU imported around 150 uh, BCM of natural gas uh, from Russia through pipelines and around 17 BCM as LNG, so which taken together represents 44% uh, of total EU used natural gas consumption, so out of 379, uh, according to the uh, to BP. Uh, so that uh, gives you a little bit sort of the size of the challenge uh, ahead uh, in, in numbers. And the market uncertainty has led to enormous increases in gas and electricity prices. So according to the European Commission, the retail gas prices grew by 65% uh, this year compared to last year. And these high gas prices uh, and generally higher volumes uh, to fill storage uh, being bought after the beginning of war meant that the EU member states were transferring much higher amounts um, per day as compared to the, like, I mean, financial amounts, uh, as, as compared uh, to the same uh, period uh, last year. Um, and this is a development which is majorly at odds with the EU's efforts to impose economic sanctions on, on Russia. So this is the first point. And overall, I think there are two major points and motivations to consider when thinking about stopping new gas dependence on Russian fossil fuels. So the first one is the point that continuing fossil fuel trade with Russian ga gas goes against the efforts of economic sanctions. And the second point also that from the EU self-interest, current reliance on Russian gas has led to enormous costs for consumers, especially for countries that are majorly dependent on Russian gas and electricity and heating. Um, and I think Casper before mentioned uh, the protection of consumers with, with tariffs. For example, I'm from Austria and in Austria also, um, some consumers actually have a free floating tariff. So those were hit very hardly uh, by extremely high gas, uh, gas bills this year. So this is really, I think, also a major issue that is now currently also in the political debate. Because for some people, this would really mean energy poverty when you have to pay uh, half of your salary or more uh, for gas and electricity bills this, uh, this year. As a reaction to the growing new gas security concerns, uh, the EU Commission has tabled the so-called uh, Repower EU strategy, which was uh, mentioned before, um, in which it envisions Europe's independence from Russian fossil fuel by 2030, uh, by speeding up also many of the measures proposed in fit for 55 policy package under, under the European Green Deal. Um, and there have been also other proposals, uh, such as by the International Energy Agency. And the EU's proposal is generally more ambitious. So they, uh, the EU envisions Russian gas demand reduction uh, by 100 BCM. Uh, and for example, the International Energy Agency envisions a gas demand um, reduction by 90 BCM. Uh, but there are also some differences in sort of in the envisioned strategies and how it can actually be implemented. So the use plan, for example, generally relies more on the users of renewable energy. So they're much more optimistic uh, in terms of how fast, for example, um, solar energy can be scaled up. While International Energy Agency envisions, um, for example, also intermediate higher rel reliance and consumption of coal. Uh, overall, there is a general agreement uh, that decreasing reliance on uh, Russian fossil fuels is technically feasible. So there are also now uh, more and more scenarios and studies showing uh, under which conditions this is technically feasible. But as we all agree, uh, this requires a major political effort. So to address the point about the effectiveness of, of sanctions, uh, time is essential. Uh, because Russia is also preparing at the same time to reroute its gas supplies to China uh, to at least partially balance out also the expected fallouts, uh, fallouts from the EU side. Um, and time is also essential for the European consumers, but also for local companies. So they need support over the summer and fall to replace gas where possible uh, with many currently available alternatives. But 
uh, we need a major public campaign, um, as we see also from research that many customers are not aware uh, quite often of the uh, alternative technologies that they can also implement themselves uh, to, to replace, for example, gas uh, in heating, uh, and then the financial support that is also available for them in many countries. So at the EU level, um, there seems to be an agreement pertaining to the ban on coal, partially oil, but lots of disagreement regarding gas. So the most prominent case uh, is Germany, which obtains more than half of its gas from Russia. Given the many different options in terms of which technologies uh, each individual member state can use to replace Russian gas, it is essential that countries take a coordinated approach and implement policies that protect consumers from increases in prices uh, and secure support for these short and medium term policy and energy goals. Yet with the gas security regulation also of 2017, uh, we also have uh, clear established rules at the European level. And so in this context, uh, for example, also the ENSOC um, has um, a clearly defined role in coordinating <coughs> member state efforts um, and also making sure that this uh, common approach to gas security issues is taken.